What's up? What the fuck is up, Denny's? I mean, Jeff Con. Hi, I'm Jimmy Two Times, and I'm here to talk about how I broke my Chromebook with a Pico Ducky. <coughs> I'll also say this. I'm a goon. I've lost my voice, and I'm going to do my best here, so bear with me. Um, my name is Jimmy Two Times, Jim Ali, as I said before. Um, I'm the CEO of Lost Rabbit Labs right now. <coughs> I am a former member of the U.S. National Video Game Team. You can see um, some history there on osgrelics.com, old school gaming. Um, my hacking led me to get involved in the video game industry back in the 80s. I was the first person to beat Mike Tyson's punch out, a bunch of NES and Sega Master System games. And I'm actually uh, two characters in two Sega Master System games, Zillion 2 and Wonder Boy and Monster Land represent. Um, 20 years martial arts student. I think that it is important to be scholar warriorly in our hacker um, in everything we do. And so that, I just wanted to mention that and I am dedicated to gamifying our craft because this is all fucking fun. Um, it's my first time presenting. I've been a goon for six years, Sky Talks for eight, and this is a huge honor. So thank you, DEF CON, and thank you everybody for showing up. Appreciate it. <clears throat> so we will be covering gamified hacking, container breakouts, fuzzing strategy, LOL binning, living off the land, uh, retro assessments, unorthodox methods, and one-liners for the fucking win. Um, I will say, the, first off, this exploit is on an end-of-life Chromebook. Um, it's a known vulnerability that's been patched two years ago. However, I think some of the techniques in here will help bug bounty and help other folks secure their Chromebooks. Um, this Chromebook hack was done in factory reset state and it was done living off of the land really, mostly or only at the end. Um, One-liners, they're like keys. Um, it's a string that will open a door and every chance we can we'll use them here. And the Pico Ducky, it is a key. It's a, it's a shim, it's a key, you can shove it in and we'll open a door for you. So, gamified efforts. I feel like we're better at progressing when we have a challenge or an ankle weight on us. So, it's often good to put yourself in jail and really be thorough on how to get out of there to research all aspects of your environment. Um, being tenacious, thorough, and exhaustive is key in a lot of what we do, looking for the anomaly or the needle in the haystack. So performing retro hacking or retro assessments is really about taking maybe an older device and taking a look at it and see, you know, 10 years ago we had a device we didn't know much about, 10 years later we know way more, we're going to take it further if we take a look at it. Even if it's old, it's going to help us gain insight into the new versions we could create and some of the challenges that we need to solve. And again, putting yourself in jail here to expand your horizons. It's just really about being thorough again with what's in front of you, not thinking you need an exploit or a zero day, or it's about being tenacious and trying all possibilities. So again, too long didn't read here. We took an old EOL Chromebook, HP v Pavilion 14, in an out of box experience state. And it's able, um, with the guest user, we're able to gain local access through a, a crash breakout um, when Linux isn't supposed to be enabled yet. And we're doing that by exploiting a command injection in the set underscore command set. Um, and we're able to utilize shill scripts and the Kronos user accounts and root before developer mode has been enabled and before any passwords have been assigned to the existing users. Um, one of the other uh, exploits that was discovered was a command injection in DBus, and that is where we got our root from. Um, we were able to fuzz a parameter there and gain root access. And again, there's a couple of tricks here, old school tricks, redirection operators, internal field separator, and we'll get more into that as we go. 
Passionate curiosity is absolutely not a crime. It's just not. It's no that. Um, right to repair. Um, it's our hardware. We bought it. We should be able to do what we want. Um, if we're afraid of affecting somebody's upstream infrastructure, we can just sever the, sever the network, sever communications. In this case, I did not. I wanted to connect into the Google Cloud, and, and we did go from there. So these are all non-destructive techniques, meaning we didn't have to open a laptop up or we didn't have to uh, do anything crazy to modify anything here. And again, I was inspired really to do it. I like kiosk breakouts. They're fun. You know, it's a challenge. They're small little CTFs. So anytime you can break out of a jail, you win. The hardware we're using here today is going to be HP Pavilion, uh, Raspberry Pico, and the Pico duck, Ducky software. And again, we'll talk about that in a second here. So one thing I'll mention here on the slide deck is it's done sort of in the form of a video game. So this is how to play the game. Set up the environment. We began by uh, factory resetting the Chromebook, power washing it. Then we boot it up. For the first time boot, we log in. And we log in as guests. That's how we play. The helpful commands here uh, during the out-of-box experience are for fun. There's actually something called shark mode. I didn't know that. One time I was booting up, I pounded on all the keys. It's an actual technique to find stuff. Pounded the keys and I saw shark mode, shark mode, and I got to find out it's part of their enrollment process. But there's a bunch of shortcut keys we found there. And um, you can also force your out-of-box experience back into uh, the original state by deleting a couple of files out of home chronos and removing any user on the system. So this is our game map. The, we, we have a Chromebook. We want to choose our attack path. So we have the Chrome browser. Um, we have the crush window, which has a limited shell. We, have, we can sideload, USB, SD, whatever else, inputs. We have network. And I started off first with the crash window just because Linux, Linux terminal. We want shells. So I ended up going that route. And let's see here. Just looking at the cross shell by default, it's not um, Linux enabled all the way in the back end as far as you can tell. There's no shell command yet. Um, but you do have crush dash dash dev and dash dash removable if you can run the binary. And let's see here. So fuzzing, we want to, we know we're going to have to fuzz. We know we're going to have to throw a lot of payloads at inputs. And we don't want to do that as a human. Your hands will hurt and your brain will hurt. So we started off here using the rubber ducky. I like doing rubber ducky stuff, but memory limitations, way too slow. So ask from the info booth, thank you, ask. Let me know that the Pico Ducky software is awesome that Dave Bailey had created. And so I started the engage or I started this whole uh, project out with a rubber ducky and I got it far, but as soon as I put use the Pico, it just was night and day. And here we go, round one. So we know that we have a cross shell. We have some commands that we can utilize. Um, you can go through those uh, and extract them and put them in a text file. We're going to take all the commands and put them in commands.txt. Then we're going to take some fuzz payloads and strings and shove them in another text file. This is how we're going to build our test harness and how we're going to try to attack the, duck, or the Chromebook here with using the ducky. So I just created a small Python script. I call it fuzzy ducky. It takes the commands, one command per line, and the fuzz payload one per line, and it will mush them together for you, basically. Um, tons of payload lists out there, uh, fuzz lists. I got to give a shout out to Dan McInerney for his little short fuzz list. Very interesting and unique. And then, of course, we also have things like the sec list and big list and naughty strings and anything else you can throw at it. Um, this is the fuzzy ducky script on the left. It's that simple. Takes the commands in from one file and uh, the commands and then the fuzz from the other, puts them together and converts it into the payload.dd file, which then can be transferred over to the pico ducky. 
And once again, thank you, Dave Bailey, for a great piece of software. You can find it at github.com, D-B-I-S-U. Um, it uses CircuitPy, it's so simple to set up, piece of cake. So we have our ducky, we have our shim. So we're gonna open our Chromebook with the cross window, control alt T, and we're going to direct the input into the browser window. From there we plug in our Pico ducky and it starts fuzzing every command. And it's probably hard to see some of these screenshots, but if you take a look at the slide deck, which is gonna be available, you will be able to see all these commands. And I wanted to kind of like pick so it didn't happen on every aspect of this project. So it's all about sharing all this info so you can see what challenges I had and how I worked through things. Um, when we run our fuzz list here, we don't see much uh, the first iteration, but once we start getting in <clears throat> to some of the other payloads and running binaries here, we, we saw a, where the Scooby-Doo is here, we can see that we got an eval error and a syntax error, an unterminated quoted string. Those are things to get excited about. Um, we definitely saw other errors from commands that we tried to run, but we didn't really see anything that showed us we had an actual binary that would work yet. So we keep going and we find, even just using a parenthesis, left parenthesis and right generates an error and it tells you cut dash dash help. So now we know cuts involved somehow. From there we keep on fuzzing and you know, once you see a result for something, you just wanna focus in that one area, maybe add more characters, double the payloads, put a thousand characters after it and keep nailing that one spot over and over again. So analyze the results, checking all the output, looking for anomalies and verbose errors. Um, the command injection and in going through that whole process is sometimes really tough. Um, even doing things like XSS, you can't always get the payload you're looking for unless you spend hours, you know, trying to figure out how to get it to work. Um, IPF, we were able to use the internal, yeah, the IPF stuff here, where is it? No, okay. Um, we're using existing OS functions to create like our variables and solve our challenges here. And then we use um, some redirection tricks for our output because initially we have blind output. We can't see anything in the front part of the shell here. So we ended up trying to redirect output after getting blind results for a while. And we figured out here that using one and over to the ampersand two here, we're gonna run the air output or the regular output through air. And that's gonna pop it to the screen here. So this example here shows set underscore APN and we have our parentheses, or sorry, ticks here, curl, dollar sign IFS, no, that's our space character, dash dash help, dollar sign IFS one, over to ampersand two. That actually takes output and puts it through the cross shell to where you can see it, where normally you'd be on the back end. So now we have output, we're no longer blind. From there, I have like top, I say top 20, we used to call it top 10, but the first initial top 20 info gathering commands I would try to run at this point. You know, this would be ID and things to identify the file system. Uh, looking for U name and things like that, um, catting Etsy password, tailing var log messages, and we were actually able to do all that. We're able to pull using again set underscore APN with the LS dollar sign IFS dash AL dollar sign IFS, and we have everything on the screen now from uh, the password file and from the directory listing. And let's see here, um, exfiltration tool. So. While we're looking for binaries we can run on the system, it's always good to try to figure out what you can use to input data and output data. So we wanna upload, we wanna exfiltrate. Um, we were able to see that we had tar, curl, SFTP, SCP, SSH, OpenSSL, OpenVPN, ping, SMB client, and base64, all available to us uh, from behind the curtain there. So we're gonna continue with command injection. You know, we really wanna get a shell at some point or get some more substantial foothold. So 
we start fuzzing again all these binaries on the system and we notice that set underscore APN, all of them are vulnerable to this command injection. But what we end up finding out is that some command injections require uh, a parenthesis or uh, brackets around the IFS as opposed to just dollar sign IFS. And when it does that, it splits out your parameters and run, runs them slightly differently. So on the right, you'll see IFS versus dollar sign uh, brackets IFS. And when we run those four commands, set underscore APN or the ARP GW or the cellular underscore PPP or the wake on land there, we will see that three of those commands run as the shill scripts user. One of them runs as chrono. So we have an anomalous binary there that's running as a different user. So right now we have access potentially to two users on the backend system. We need to hack more, so we are going to do that with the power glove. All right, so obtaining a reverse shell. Now that we know we can't really access anything locally per se through the window, we are going to try to get an out of band shell or access here. So I took a laptop, attacker box here, and I set up a shell a script on it to make a name pipes and temp directory to use OpenSSL uh, to connect back into the Chromebook here. So on the Chromebook side, we can take, and actually let me finish that up. We also have a Python simple web server running on the attacker box uh, with the open SSL server with our generated key. So now back on the Chrome box, we can do our set underscore APN command injection using curl dash cap L and we can run that script file on the Chromebook and we actually get a reverse shell now and we are shill scripts and I used the duck man over there for that user profile. So let's take a look at the other command. Set underscore cellular underscore PPP allowed us access to the Kronos user. So let's see what happens when we try to get a reverse shell there. Um, we do the same method and we find out we indeed end up as the Kronos user instead of shell scripts. So we have access to two users now. Um, we want to kind of compare them, see how they're different, see if there's any anomalies, mount spaces, name spaces, capabilities. So now it's about trying to identify unique uh, privileges or capabilities in these users. This, you're probably not going to be able to see all that. I'm not sure. But again, it's more comparison around uh, all of the capabilities, C groups, namespaces, and things like that for comparison. And what we do see is that there are different mount points for these users. We know that the Chrome users are jailed. Uh, and in this version of Chrome, it was 65. Um, they were using mini jail for most everything. And so we know that some users are wrapped in a user script with a mini jail and restricted privileges or elevated. So we run some more commands here for info gathering and looking at the kernel. We find there's a var log debug vboot noisy.log that has some information about the system, firmware, etc. Um, our, our proc version tells us that we're running You can see that it's an older Chromebook there based on the date. Um, Linux version is 3.8.11. And then again, all the CPU, cat issue, all the OS related information, syscontrol A, and we can see where we're being blocked. We can't do, um, we have protected hard links and protected sim links. So they've secured it pretty good that way. And so this is where I took the approach of trying to run every command on the system as each of those users, literally being thorough and seeing if there was anything that would be anomalous, elevate privileges, or, you know, just do something weird. So we found out if we try to run the Chrome OS set dev password, we can't do that because we have no developer mode. Um, we found a generate logs uh, binary on there that will dump all the logs for you and save them to a tarball. And of course, now we can exfiltrate that with our FTP and curl and everything else we have running. Um, we can try to run some of the uh, processes um, as Kronos, but they won't run because you don't have root privileges. So, like Chrome Sandbox and some other disk commands, PPP. Um, 
they won't give you, uh, they'll let you know you're not root, so you can validate that. Um, I have a screenshot over here just showing also that when we try to look at the cap mem on a certain process, um, ptrace is not enabled for us to do that and it creates a log of that. So again, more information, keep your eye on the logs as you're tinkering. So one of the things we figured out, I mentioned earlier, cross uh, dash dash dev would upgrade your cross shell. So if you actually do the command injection here and do your cross, or cross dash dash dev, you'll actually get the elevated cross shell. And that gives you new commands. You can live in a coal mine, it puts you in the, you know, the non-standard uh, software there. Um, packet capture and systrace for the other two. So we upgrade and we start trying to run these other commands and we find that running the packet capture uh, fires off a process uh, using user lib exec debug D and it's a capture utility and it puts it in a mini jail. If we look at the bottom here, you can see we have a root process running mini jail with some other parameters here, the capture utility, the file descriptor and the device. Before I moved on, I actually provisioned my attacker box to the fullest I could to communicate with the Chromebook to give me all options available. Um, we actually had SMB on there, so you can do SMB transfers. Um, you can do peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, obviously, the OpenSSL was on there as well. You can run a local OpenSSL server on the Chromebook as well, and you can log in locally if you needed to, which we'll look at here in a second as well. Um, but all these commands are just the normal Linux commands that you would run versus the Chromebook command injection formatted commands, just for comparison. So after tinkering for some time, I realized why didn't I just try to run bash from the shell, like since I had a command injection? Well, it worked, but there was no output. But again, we know we have our redirector, and if you do exec, you know, one, redirect to ampersand two, we now see the output in our terminal. So now we actually have a full local Linux shell. It's local. It didn't need to have uh, an external system to do the shell. So we've basically done a breakout right there. And we can validate that we're chrono still. We can do all the same kind of commands we were running before, but of course we don't have to do any command injections. We're just free to roam. So um, one of the things I tried to do here was make a one-liner to basically write to the bash RC so that would permanently put in uh, the exact command there to, for the redirector. That just makes it persistent for that session. Um, end center is another one. Um, breakouts with end center. I did SQLite. You can actually get out there with SQLite and run in the dot shell bash command from there. Um, there's a few other ways that you can do it. Um, let's see here. Uh, dash is on there as well. And we have SQLite on there, which is nice because they use a lot of SQLite database files on the Chromebook, so that's why it's there. Over with our other user then, shell scripts, we go back and we run our, uh, if you remember here, set underscore APN allows uh, the shell scripts user, whereas set underscore cellular underscore PPP is our Kronos user. So we want we want our shell scripts user, and the way we do that is by provisioning OpenSSL locally and then running our command injection with, uh, and actually we have to run it with Kronos to actually have it bind to the system or it doesn't have the right permissions with shell scripts. So it's kind of hybridy, but we end up getting a shell here. And this shell that we get is kind of special. Kronos user shuts off when you log out. It shuts all the processes off for Kronos, or if you close the laptop lid. Um, if you're using the shell scripts reverse shell, it doesn't shut down. It stays up and running because it doesn't get killed by the Kronos user's processes. Um, so we have local access, and again, this is just how to set it up. You have to set up your key, your cert PM, and we throw that in var temp, and it turns out var temp's got some persistence there across reboots. Um, in Chrome tab one, we would do our set cellular command as our Kronos user uh, for our OpenSSL. 
Then in our second tab, we start the open SSL client running as a shell scripts user with our set underscore APN. And again, we had, uh, we had some issues with the payload. Um, so we had to use base 64 to pass it through, which works just fine since we have it on the Chromebook. And I haven't really mentioned it yet, um, but in order to get our interactive TTY, we use user bin script dash QC and using bash there. You could use dash or sh or whatever else you wanted. So now we have two users locally. We no longer need our attacker box. Um, here's the other cool thing. We found out that we have hard-coded keys on the Chromebook. They're test keys that the Chrome OS has. And they're stored in user share Chrome OS dash SSH dash config keys. And so what we can do is we can actually, if we couldn't access the private key, it turns out we can just curl it from Chromium, googlesource.com, where they have the SSH underscore keys dot tar dot GZ file. We save it to the Chromebook. We, we provision them into the temp directory. We could use our temp as well. We schmod it. We run our SSH on a non-standard port, and it's running. And then we can log in locally then uh, with the shell scripts user by SSHing, or we're already shell, uh, uh, shell scripts, but we use SSH uh, to log in locally using those private keys that are hard coded then matching with our keys we put in temp and we're able to log in as Kronos via shill scripts user. So a little priv uh, escalation through living off the land again. So really we're trying to get roots I guess. I mean you know we're still really investigating the system. Um, but we really do want to find root. So again, we're going to look at the users again, just validate what we have here. Um, Kronos cannot run the pseudo binary, whereas shell scripts can. Um, you can write to a var temp and you can write to home slash Kronos for persistence. Um, shell scripts can do var temp but not the Kronos directory. Uh, the Kronos user can modify all uh, SQLite 3 database files on the system because the logged in user for the Chromebook is Chronos. So we're able to, to manipulate those files. Um, the shell scripts user has access to debug D and privileged processes though. So, you know, both, both accounts look good to continue investigating. So again, looking at some more uh, normal priv type of stuff, looking for low hanging fruit, um, and we didn't really find any of that. We do see files that may run as root or with pr root privileges, but the way they've done jailing, it, it was pretty secure. Um, sockets, we saw some of the sockets laying around, so we did try to connect the sockets here. Uh, we had cups available, Avahi daemon, and a couple other things. Um, didn't really make any progress there. So now I go for the unorthodox methods, crashing, glitching, and creating anomalies. And it's something that we did back in the old video game days where, for instance, in the Sega Master System, if you cartridge tilted, there was sometimes a second game on the chip. Uh, Sega Genesis, I think the first like 10 or so games that came out had both the Japanese chips and the American games on there and they didn't have time to remove the other chips so they left them both in. So if you cartridge tilt, you can actually get a second game out of these old games. Um, I'll do one more. NES, uh, Nintendo, uh, the first Nintendo, there was a game called Xanak. It was a space shooter. And if you took a zapper gun and plugged it into port two and went on the first controller and then lifted the game up on the Nintendo a little bit till it kind of flickered and you pushed it back down, when you saw the high score change to a fucked up symbol, you knew you had it. And it, let you access level selectors and all kinds of weird stuff. You'd hit the select key and you'd warp three levels or hit the A button. Just anomalous behavior. So we're going to kind of go for some of that here uh, by doing nested jails and trying to overlap namespaces and things of that nature. So looking at all of your logs, you got var log, uh, chrome, home chronos, chrome underscore debug log. Uh, varlog UI, UI.latest, and of course varlog messages and secure. And dmessage, those are really, you know, all we had to look uh, at our output and our results here. So 
We try to do mini jail by using weird orders of their parameters and we found that you can access a root user and that's normal. You can take mini jail and create a root user into a container and restrict all the privs. But they were anomalous types of user environments and permission sets. So when we did this mini jail dash cap u dash small m tick tick dash m cap m tick tick with a nobody user, it sets it to root and nobody nobody and we can see that it's still home chronos. Um, Um, we cause some weird name pipes to happen and overlap and delete each other occasionally. Um, we did some sewage weirdness here. There's some logs in here that you can look at later just to see the result. But we were able to figure out that running certain commands would cause a kind of a shadow PTS or a TTY and they would overlap in the actual screen uh, for the user. So it might be kind of hard to see on the far left here, but I tried to exit out of this and it logged me out, but then I'm trying to type stuff and then you can see at the bottom it starts getting weird, something died here, crush, prompt shows up, but then we got three dots and an arrow. Um, over here, same kind of thing, we try to exit crush, we exit it, um, or it won't let us exit because it says it's only XI. So our characters are being split in some way and we have no idea, no visibility into that. Um, so again, tinkering more uh, will provide more information in our logs. Um, trying to do pseudos in certain environments would actually half work sort of and leave interesting logs. And we were able to again overlap file descriptors and namespace in really weird ways. Um, that didn't gain us any extra uh, permissions. But it, we did gain a lot of information on how weird and anomalous these overlapping uh, processes could cause the TTYs to be. So we're going to pull back a minute and look at all the users and we're going to we're going to look at uh, Etsy password and Etsy group for all of our possible users and groups here. And we can use mini jail to specify our user or group. And then we can specify a shell or a command to run after it. And so we spent time just kind of enumerating. We could be the bin user and daemon and ADM. And turns out if you have a user ID that doesn't exist, your name is I have no name at localhost. Um, again, over here, some of the output from some of the mini jail uh, environment and set here, and you can see nobody, nobody, nobody. Um, sometimes you see, you know, we got cops here, nobody. So again, we can kind of provision some of the users, but we don't know if they'll work the right way if we don't have the right mount spaces and capabilities for them. But it's interesting to just go through all that and see if you can find some weird place to privesk there. And there's definitely room to play there. Um, let's visit all of our cellmates, shall we? So on the Chromebook, there's a command called pinky that will tell you the real uh, world or the real life user uh, information in a quick format there. So that's easy enough to kind of go through. You can see what shells are set for each user and the uh, description. So here we did, uh, again, our mini jail, messing around with the root, uh, trying to create a root user. And we use this dash um, tick zero, 1001, 1000 representing the Kronos user. And we're trying to see if we can somehow access uh, user one here, user ID one and user ID zero. They'll, they'll actually do a swap when you run mini jail so that when you leave the container you get your original rights back out. And we found through tampering you could actually cause some really anomalous stuff where you had slight root access or you could run root commands that would start to run and maybe fail because you weren't in the right environment but it still disclosed information. It keeps on providing you with what you need to move forward. <coughs> So we're going to try to get that, that root user out using a reverse shell here since we couldn't get it locally. Maybe there is something with the set underscore commands that gets provisioned and does a privask or something. 
So we try to do, <coughs> excuse me, a reverse shell and do our open SSL connection here. Uh, we see that we are root ID zero, but we are GID nobody and group nobody here. So that is not root all the way. Um, we can check in the environment again here to see who we really are. And we find out that we're Howard the Duck, the Kronos user. And we know that our ID equals user, uh, our user that we have here is not really our real, uh, real root user. It's just mapped to the outside of the mini jail to Kronos, which again is expected. That's how it's supposed to work. But maybe there is some kind of way to get, again, this user out. So we went back in with set cellular PPP, tried our reverse shell again uh, through this or the mini jail bash command. And if we do an SU, it actually would give us limited root. We were able to run SU dash with that mini jail configuration. Um, from there, we try to run other root commands and find out maybe we're limited still. We don't have the right mount space. We don't have the right capabilities yet. So we keep on tinkering here. We're trying to break it. We're trying SU. We're trying sudo. And we're getting all kinds of different information back from our phony root user here. If we run Chrome Sandbox before, we couldn't run that. Now it tells us that the set UID sandbox provides API version one, but you need zero. And it says close bad file descriptor and read on socket pair success. I don't know why, but that all popped up from that. Um, wasn't able to use it in any way. Um, another one here showing the difference between the first bad root user. Uh, that we didn't do the um, open SSL and the SU with, if we run dev install there, it says your environment appears to be incomplete when changing to root. Did you remember to run the full command? Don't forget the dash. So they literally tell you <laughs> what you need to run. So I ran sudo su dash. And now when I run dev install, it just says that it's not in developer mode. So that tells me I've gained some kind of privilege escalation there in a small way. So being thorough again and looking at everything, I was kind of at a dead end. So we have DBus on the system and DBus is all over the place now and there are a lot of insecurities. There's a lot of processes that can be run as root and for some reason we don't, we're not as resilient around the code and checking input sanitization there. Um, so DBus can also be complicated to go through. There's just a lot of data to look at. So I pretty much wrote a bash script to help me identify all the endpoints and do introspect and things of that nature. But it's still good to go through them uh, manually and look at things. I did a lot of grepping there. Um, I would grep for policy user equals root in the Etsy dbus dash one system D directory through all the conf files to see what was root versus Kronos versus shill. Um, that's, that's a good place to start there. And from there, we start trying to maybe figure out if we can run some of these commands. Um, and again, through introspection, we're going to do an introspect and see what all of our options are. Um, this is the script that I wrote. It's, just, it's a really um, nominal script, but it will uh, connect to Dbus and it will actually output all of the, uh, the interfaces and members inside of a file. And you can easily grep those in as well. And when you do, um, when you connect to Dbus uh, that's running versus, you know, asking for the activatable uh, members through introspect or uh, interfaces, you get different results back. It's better for you to actually connect to the Dbus and see what it spits out. They might be obfuscating code or this or that. So you just got to try it. And what we end up with is a whole bunch of text files that basically just get spit out into a temp directory. And I had it pre-populate the GDBus monitor system for all of them so I could quickly just enumerate through those and then spit the files out uh, in this type of way to where we can see cryptohome.conf and whoops, all of the um, all of the members here and all the calls that we can make. So cryptohome has to do with encrypting the users, you know, information. And it looks like we can access that in some way. And of course, because we are Kronos, we know we should be able to access that maybe for our own user. 
So again, some of the method and signal exploration that was done here, these are some of the sample commands on some of the endpoints, um, you know, that actually worked for us. We were able to get like our sanitized username from the crypto home uh, interface here and uh, information about blues, our Bluetooth stack, uh, a Vahi daemon, everything that's, you know, using Dbuzz. So we're going to try to start running some of those just to see what happens um, and if we have access to all those. Some commands we were able to run, they would run as root, but we couldn't do anything. Uh, some commands would actually run. Um, you can, you know, ping. You're not allowed to ping by default before developer mode on Kronos, but you can use dbus to do it. Um, you can set the user password. Uh, you can't do it for, uh, or you, you could do it, but you can't do it before uh, dev mode has been disabled. And then we looked at enabling Chrome features here, just trying, and it says use of this tool is restricted to dev mode. So we're just being blocked in a lot of ways from running some of this stuff. So now it's time to try to find a vulnerability. And so this is where the fuzzing comes in again. Um, we didn't need to use a Pico for this part per se because we have the file system. But um, we found again this packet capture start, which if you remember back, we saw that the packet capture utility runs as root. So we have Dbus here and we know that we can run a packet capture because we tested it. And so once we get into the fuzzing, we find out that there is a place that t accepts a command and it's coming off of the HD location. And so the way I test blind injections like that is to, is to um, do reboot. It's just a really quick way to do it. So I was able to find that reboot would run as root through this command injection. So I, I tried to run a bunch of commands and none of them would work really unless they were only one word commands. And VI almost worked for me. When you run VI there, it runs two processes as Kronos and one as root, but you can't access it and you can't break out of the shell. But I found that there's a binary called EX that lets us actually get what we need out of it. So this right here is our, let me go back here. This is our full attack path to root. Um, this is the whole provisioning process on the Chromebook that you need to do that I talked about before. And when you run this packet capture uh, command, you can see that every other time I hit enter, I get a different prompt. Now that's matching up with what we saw before where things were kind of going into the back. So what we found is that one of those processes is root and one is Kronos. So, we just figure, uh, let's just run the same command twice and it's gonna work. So I did that and it worked. I was able to uh, get SSH running, uh, turn on IP tables and let SSH run through. So now we can SSH to our own local port 22 using the home Kronos SSH keys and we can log in as root. And when we actually look at our environment there, we're root, that's it, we're done. And so we look at environment and set commands to validate that. We're gonna go back and look at some of the other commands we haven't run before, check namespaces, everything lines up. We are root now. And so we're gonna, uh, there's a IP tables command there again. We can run fdisk now. We can try Chrome OS set dev password. It won't, uh, it will work for us now. And we can actually cat the dev mode dash password out and see that. Um, we can run Doug B uh, debug FS and access file systems there and actually CAD the Etsy shadow file. So we know we're root all the way. So taking the Pico Ducky, I put one script on the Pico Ducky. So if I plug it into my Chromebook, it takes about 30 seconds and it will go through this process and it will leave three tabs up on the Chromebook. One is shill scripts, one is Kronos, and one is root. So that is where the master key for the Ducky comes in. Um, again, just trying to be efficient, do one-liners. So again, here's the actual uh, payload.dd type of format would look like. So if you're not doing it on the command line, you're doing it through the Pico, you obviously have to use the ducky language there. So that's what the payload.dd file looks like. That's not the whole thing. 
bonus round. Um, now that we're root, we can run Bluetooth control. Uh, we don't have to use the BT console anymore and we can do what we want there. Um, we can find and decrypt the Wi-Fi password and bar cache shield default that profile and use a, uh, an echo into TR there. And then we can also um, start messing around with firmware updating. Um, another trick was again, if you stop power D, it will allow all of the users to not be, uh, you'll have a persistent shell and the shell won't close when you close the lid on the Chromebook. That's all required. I hated having to open the lid back up and wait. So I figured that out. If you stop power D, you don't have to, you can just keep the lid closed and work on it. Um, some of the other things we're able to do is inject reverse shell into the bash RC for the Chronos user. So when they log in, I would get a reverse shell out of band then. Um, we can tamper with the SQL light files um, and enumerate the Chrome and file functions of, of the URL bar. So real quick, uh, SQLite's everywhere in there. All of our Google data's in there. There's credit card data in there. There's your history. Um, and then shout out to my boys over here, Poncho and Red Team Wins and who do we got all there? Bryce. Um, back when I worked, uh, at Coal Fire here, we did something called cookie baking and we figured out we could stuff cookies by deleting an existing cookie and even if it was encrypted, we could put it back in as a null encrypted cookie and it would, it would work. So here's an example of uh, stuffing that cookie basically using the SQLite file and it says LRL was here. Um, using the Pico Ducky, you can do a Chrome uh, enumeration using the URL bar and if you uh, don't know what options there are, you can get them from Chrome uh, colon slash slash about. You can grab the file system and you can uh, do the network action predictor by typing one letter at a time and it will autofill for you, although it won't tell you all the commands. In fact, you can grab the system for more and find there's hidden ones that they don't tell you about. Um, Here's our, our file system. So by default, you can actually access file system output from the browser. This is without exploiting. This is as normal use. So in the Chrome browser, you can look at the home Chronos user downloads, even if they're not logged in, they may put something there. As a non Chronos or the non uh, authenticated user of the system, they shouldn't see that. Um, quick. Quick little shout out here, Avahi Damon. So I found a socket laying in, in run and I use curl to connect to it. And you can use the uh, Unix dash socket parameter for curl to do that. And it gave me output that told me that I should try help. So I actually just changed the HTTP verb to help and it spit out this available commands. I went and Googled it and I found on GitHub there is a C file here that references that code. And we have a if fuck equals go fuck yourself in there, Avahi. Um, anyway, that will just lead me into my shout out to Ray Liotta from Goodfellas who passed away here as well. And go fuck yourself. That is the end of my talk. Um, if you would like any information about what I've done or the script or see it work, reach out to me. I'm happy to show it to you. Um, again, I'm the CEO at Lost Rabbit Labs. I'd like to shout out to my team, Tyler and Chris over there. And again, thank you for the opportunity to speak here at DEF CON. It was an honor and a pleasure and have the best DEF CON ever. <laughs>